We have called, we have come to affirm our historic faith, the faith of ancients and of God's people today. We have come to worship the God of our spiritual ancestors, mothers and daughters. We have come to remember God's gifts to us, the living. To respond in thanksgiving to the mighty works of God in our lives. We have come to affirm our trust <coughs> in the God of all futures. To his name be blessing and honor, glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Well, please God, take part in passing of the peace, keeping the safe distance. The angel 
for the Lord encamps around those who fear God and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in God. going to have a time of remembrance and take a few moments to think about those people that have passed from this life uh, in the last year. And I came to this church, Barbara Kowalczyk was fighting a valiant battle against cancer and looked like she was winning, um, but the time came when it was time for her to leave this life. And so we want to take a few moments to just remember her, and I'm going to invite um, anyone who wants to say anything about her um, to say something. And uh, if you feel comfortable to come up to the mic, um, Dan, can you stand a second? Uh, and if not, you can stand uh, in your seat. So, I'd like to invite anybody who wants to say something now about Barbara to go ahead. We should then start. Start us off. Good morning. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Kristen Johnson, and I'm the daughter of Barbara and Stanley Kowalczyk. Their celebration of life last May was postponed with COVID, so I'm honored to be here today to celebrate them. My mom brought me here for 18 years, and she kept coming years after I had moved to New York. The bookmarks that you picked up today um, symbolize the love my mom had for her books and the memories my dad and I shared carrying them from house to house. My parents lived in Cold Spring Crossing, where all the kids grew up together and all the adults hung out together. When my mom was diagnosed with stage three ovarian cancer, my dad realized it was time to look for a smaller house with everything on one floor. He searched high and low for almost two years, but my mom loved her house in Collegeville and didn't want to leave. My dad found a house in Pottstown, which was perfect. My parents brought me out to the house to see it, and I thought it was perfect too. After lunch that day, my mom said, do you think dad would like living there alone? And I asked why she asked say that. She said, well, the cancer came back and I now have stage four ovarian cancer and I just don't think I'll make it to the house. I looked at my dad and said, buy the house. We're all gonna make it there. And so my dad, my mom did another chemo treatment and I started to pack her house in Collegeville. She wasn't interested in decorating the house anymore. My dad was getting worried that she had checked out. So I told my dad over the phone I had a plan and I needed to go, him to go along with it. I came home on a Saturday with a headboard for my new bed. My mom was like, why would you buy that? And I said, well, if you aren't decorating the house, I'm decorating it. Lord knows dad would make it bad decisions on decorations in the new house. <laughs> she looked at my dad and said, did you approve this, Stanley? And my dad said, well, Barb, you said it was my house, so Chris is decorating her room, and I'm thinking about buying a red recliner. What do you think? And without being missing a beat, I said, oh, and we're getting rid of your 300 books. We will do donate them to a good organization, but dad and I need to make room for the new surround sound system. <laughs> He loved his big screen TV. Well, that made him really upset. 
She gave me that look that she gave me so many times before and said, Kristen Alice, if you think you're getting rid of my books, you are nuts. Those are my books and I want them at the new house. And Stanley, red is not in your color palette. <laughs> my dad and I smile because we knew she got her fight back. And my dad, without missing a beat, says, do I get to have my surround sound system? And I said, no. <laughs> we were moving things over to the new house slowly. And my dad said, Barbara, you have too many books. My mom called me and said, I need you to put all the books in your car and take them to the basement in Paz Town and don't tell your father. <laughs> I was like, Mom, he's going to get mad. So I woke up at 5 a.m. and parked all of her books in my car. I made three trips that morning before they even woke up. When my dad asked what was in the boxes, I said, you know, Mom has a lot of stuff. We both smiled because she really did have a lot of stuff. Once my parents got settled into Pottstown House, my dad went to the basement only to find the 30 boxes of books. I got another Kristen Alice, what were you thinking? I was like, that's what she wanted. I got her books to the house, and those books got her to the house. Once my parents both got sick, my husband Lake and I offered my parents to move in with us. My mom was on board immediately. It took my dad some time to come around to the idea. Once we all agreed it was a good idea, we talked about the essentials in their house that they would need to get onto the moving truck. And once again, my mom said, I want my books to come. My dad and I rolled her eyes and said, Barb, we haven't read those books in over a year. And she said, well, if Leif can bring all of his historical books to the new house, I can bring my books. And so I packed up those books again. And again, those books got my mom to the house in work. I hope when you look at the bookmark, you will think of my parents and those 300 books that kept my parents moving forward in their journey. Thank you for having me today, and thank you for taking time to honor my parents. Thank you so much. I confess to being a book lover too, so <laughs> I understand. Would anyone else like to say anything about Barbara or Stan? This time, please. Barbara was, to say the least, a very unique person. I guess that describes her the best. She had a wit. She always had a witty comment. She never minced words. She'd say things back. She answered questions without mincing words. She told it like it was. That's just the way it was with Barbara. And don't try to argue with her about anything. I could tell a dozen different stories about traveling with Barbara, uh, but you all had to just be there or you wouldn't really get it. <laughs> only, only a couple people in the back row there would understand when I talk about Barbara getting lost at the tennis courts. <laughs> Don't ask. She was on her way back to her room in the middle of the night and um, somehow she ended up in the tennis courts or were on the other side of the resort. But, Barb did not have, if anything, she was lacking. It was a sense of direction, <laughs> definitely. Um, but Barbara loved this church. Uh, a few years ago, she got a little bee in her bonnet and decided she was going to go elsewhere. So she left us for about, I don't know, six months or something, maybe a year. I forget not exactly what it was. But in that time, she got sick. She was at a different church. She got sick. And she realized that the people in that church, and this is no offense to another church, but the people in their church didn't know her, didn't care. They never gave her the support that she needed at the time. And meanwhile, even though she wasn't here, we all reached out to her. We visited, we took prayer shawls to her, we made cans of soup, took to her, and I think she had a light bulb moment the bee flew away, and she came back. And she was very happy to be back with us. And we were very happy to be back also. Some of you will remember, I mean, that it stands out in my mind huge. When she had her surgery, oh, oh backtrack. Landry adopted Barbara in the back row. You all know that when she, once he got mobile 
Once he got more comfortable, every Sunday he's sitting in the back row with, with Barb and Judith. Well, Barb had surgery, rehab. She was gone for like two months, give or take. She came back finally to us in uh, back to church in July, and uh, the uh, Mark's family arrived. Landry comes in that door, spotted her. They, you remember, his face lit up like a Christmas tree. Beeline down the aisle, and a freight train could not have stopped him to jump in that back row and sit with Barbara. He had his, his buddy back, and uh, she had her buddy back. And it was a great example of the love that she had for people, for Landry. Landry was a great example of love for other people. She was, he was back, she was back. And it was a wonderful thing. You know, I'll never forget Landry coming down the aisle. One thing about Stan that I have to say, Stan was one of the good guys of the world. Just one of the good guys. He would, the, the, the uh, old adage, he would give you the shirt off his back, that was Stan. He would jump at anything you needed help, Stan. My son was uh, replacing the French doors at our house a couple years ago. And uh, French doors, I mean, they're huge, they're big. And Dan, my son Dan, was, I can't do this by myself. I picked up a phone, I called Stan, and I said, Dan needs some help. Oh, no problem, put my shoes on, I'll be down there in five minutes. That was Stan. Stan was the loving, outgoing, help anybody kind of person. And Kristen, you, <laughs> you are definitely the product of those two people. With your sense of humor, your wit, and your reaching out and helping people in the job that you that you have, um, you are definitely your mom and dad's daughter. Okay. Thank you so much. And we also like to say something about Father or Stan. I had I had a chance to uh, to work with Stanley to Lions Club. He uh, became a member in our Lions Club, and, and Stanley was the type of guy, whatever we had to do, he was there doing it. He never said no. He enjoyed selling corn at the corn booth, and uh, our, over at St. Andrew's Lutheran Church for the yard sales. He just, he just radiated love wherever he was. He, he is really missed. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else wants to say a name 
and the light came for them as well. Barbara Kowalczyk. Stanley Kowalczyk. Jack Robinson. This request from Barbara. John Furch. I have two requests from Lauren Brownstein. Harold Schweitzer. Evelyn LeBlanc. Two requests from Linda Williams. Anne Lacey. And Lucille Schaefer. Someone else like to offer a name, Beth? Bobby Pocketberry from Pam Sabnatsky. Jim Johnson and Fran Slaver. Thank God for these people and the ways that their lives blessed us. We remember them, and they will always have a special place in our hearts. Amen. Amen. the prayer for illumination. Please pray with me. Loving God, open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you, that the hearing of truth may bring light and life to us and to the world. read to you from the book of Revelation, the very last book in our Bible. And this is a part of the vision of John, Revelation 7, 9 to 17. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. And then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship Him day and night within His temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here is the baby. So you've heard this 
vision that John had and wrote down in the book of Revelation. That's what the book of Revelation is. It is the visions of someone named John. Scholars argue about which John he was. Uh, he is sometimes called John the Divine. And he had these visions and he wrote them down. And ever since, people have been trying to figure out what they mean. Revelation is a puzzling book to many. The imagery and the symbols leave a lot of room for different theories and interpretations about what they mean. And the book contains some very disturbing stories and images. There are conflicts and wars and plagues and disasters and famine and terrible evil going on on the earth. There are strange beasts and frightening predictions and the persecution of the saints of God. John describes hard times for the faithful, and as some translations put it, a great ordeal. Now down through history, almost in every generation, some people have believed that John was writing about their times. People think our times are so bad, they must be the end times. This must be what John was talking about. How could things get any worse? Have you ever thought that things are getting so crazy? How can it get any worse? We feel like our times are crazy sometimes. And at different times in history, there have been leaders who predict, predict a particular date for the end of the world, and they think they can somehow prove that from the book of Revelation. And they're so sure, they'll sometimes get large groups of people to follow them, and then what has always happened is the date that's supposed to be the end of the world comes and goes. We've heard some, we've heard some dates in our lifetime that were supposed to be the end, haven't you? <laughs> and they have come and gone. People who are fans of doom and apocalypse have used the book of Revelation for their own agendas. Perhaps they need a sense of urgency that the book gives, or they need to feel important, or they just like to scare people. In my first semester as a seminary student, I ventured into the seminary library, and I, I was just looking around to see what they had there, looking around on the shelves. And I picked up a book called The History of the Interpretation of the Book of Revelation. And it, and it showed how people in different times in history looked at this book differently. And I was thumbing through it, and, and it just kind of blew my mind. <laughs> it just opened up a whole world that I didn't even know was there. So many generations have read this book and thought that John was talking right to them. John was describing their reality. If anyone tells you they completely understand the book of Revelation, be skeptical. <laughs> because it's hard to understand. And in between all the stories of wreck and ruin in John's visions, there are a number of worship scenes, scenes of heaven. People worshiping God in heaven, just in between all the other things. And the worship scenes are beautiful. And the passage you heard today is part of one of those scenes. Where John describes what he saw, I looked and there was a multitude, no one could count, from every nation, all tribes, and all peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb. The saints, so many, that they can't even be counted, all just in white. And what's remarkable about this vision is the inclusiveness of it. And it tells us that the people in the early Christian community understood that Jesus came not just for his own people, but for all people. It is a radical vision for the times, when people were so stratified in different classes and groups and ethnicities. They understood that Jesus didn't just come for his own people, the Jews, but that he extended the invitation out to all people. They, they had the ability to imagine that God had created equal access for everyone to God. 
and that we would all stand together before the throne of God. The scene goes on to describe angels and humans alike worshiping the Lamb, which is Jesus, and say, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. It starts with an amen and ends with an amen. Those amazing words of praise. And there are a number of scenes like this in the book of Revelation, in between the other stories of horror and terrible things. And it is as though we are being offered two realities side by side. The unholy and disturbing things that happen on earth, and then the holiness of heaven, and the beauty of it, and the purity of people worshiping God. And in this vision that you heard read, the elder asked John, uh, so who are all these people? And John says, I don't know, you're the one who knows. And the elder tells him, these are the ones who have come out of the great ordeal. They've had a rough time. They've had a rough time. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. And then later on in verse 17, the elder says, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There have been tears that has been suffering. But God will wipe every tear. Now we know that the people in John's time are going through some difficult things. Persecutions, uh, wars. The world was just in a kind of, had a perpetual state of war. Uh, they had dealt with displacement, having to leave their homes, exile and sorrows. And John is showing another reality, that we have a shepherd, that the shepherd guides us, the lamb, and that we are looking forward to a time when God wipes all tears away, that we are promised joy and healing in the end. And that what's going to do this is the lamb of God. The Lamb of God will achieve this. And it, it's a contrast. You know, the symbol for a realm is a wolf. And, and most countries will choose a predatory animal to represent them because we want to be fierce and we want to dominate. And the Lamb of God itself is a radical image because it's not a picture of domination or coercion or the, the power of violence. It's an image of innocence and of of sacrifice. And that is what is going to be victorious. Not all the, the violent force of the world, but the Lamb. What an amazing image. And we see in the book of Revelation these two things side by side, these beautiful scenes of worship in heaven and these terrible things that go on on earth. And the way I, I look at it, it's as though we are living with our feet one foot in each world. We've got one foot in our world, and we can see that things are not right. There's injustice, there's violence, there's there are things that are not as they should be. But we've got the other foot in heaven, where we worship God, where we put our hope, where we know that we'll be healing, there will be joy, because God has the power to do that, and wants to do that, and will do that. And so, in a world of despair, we continue to lift up hope. In a world of hate, we lift up love. In a world of lies, we lift up the truth. Meanwhile, while all these other things are going on here, meanwhile, God is still God. Meanwhile, the saints worship what is true and holy. Meanwhile, we fall at the throne and we say with all the saints in heaven, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We'll listen now to number seven.
have enough to eat. We pray for that, Lord. We ask for grace for that. We pray for our frontline workers, our medical workers. They work so hard, but we'll be with them. This week, Lord, we are choosing leadership for our nation and, and for our local communities. We pray, Lord, that you will be with all of us, with voters, with those who are elected, and those who aren't. Oh, Lord, give us the grace and the wisdom to have a vision for better communities to come together so that we might truly find your shalom in our neighborhoods and in our nation. We pray that people will be safe. We pray that our democracy will get stronger. Because we know this is a gift from you. And so, Lord, this week, be with us as a nation and as your people. Lord, we lift up Nancy today as she will have a procedure. We ask for blessing on her and body and spirit. We pray for your church today. In this time of COVID, many churches are struggling. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the resources to do what you call us to do. For all the ways you have been with us right here at Evansburg, you know, with this church, for these times, we thank you. Give us a fire to proclaim your hope. And to know that whatever else is happening in the world, you are God. And that we serve you. We pray all these things today in Jesus' name. And we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When we hear the word of God, it calls us to commit ourselves to serving and to being faithful. Uh, we are not taking the offering as we used to do in this time, but there is an offering plate in the front here by the altar rail, and if you'd like to make a donation, you can do that by placing it in that offering plate on the way out. For those at home, um, there is a place on our website uh, to click and to make a donation if you choose to do that. Let us commit ourselves to being faithful as so many saints have been and to worshiping the true God no matter what happens in the world, no matter how crazy it seems, to remembering the hope of God, to remembering that the Lamb is the one who saves. Amen. Let us stand together and pray the prayer of dedication. Holy One, make us faithful stewards of the fragile bounty of the earth, so that we may be entrusted with the riches of heaven. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite you now to take the insert from the book that says the Lord's Supper for all souls' death, and to take the cup that you took one on the way in. Doing everything you be safe so we have these disposable cups for communion now. And when the time comes, I'm ready to open that and to receive it. Uh, it's a little tricky to get open. But, uh, and you'll notice that the top has a piece of clear stone thing with the wafer underneath it. So the thing to do is to open that, get that cellophane thing up first. And then it will open the top after that. And then you have a baggie so you can place it in there afterwards so nothing spills. 
and then we put that in the trash on your way out today. So turning to the bowl, the uh, Easter for the Lord's Supper, I just want to mention that we are at the table in the United Methodist Church. We invite all to participate. You don't have to be a member of this church or United Methodist. Uh, we ask only that you earnestly desire the grace of God in your life. Turning to our words now. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to do our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, God of the priests and the prophets, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers. God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your unending name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of the suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night which he gave himself up for us, he took bread.